and uh, on Thursday, I believe we'll be discussing eosinophilic lung diseases. And I'll just start. So no disclosures. The objectives. Um, I will try to go in depth covering some. You'll see me like covering some of the, uh, you know, eosinophilic lung diseases, you know, with more details and some of the other diseases. We don't have to spend more time on them. All what we need is just to keep them in mind as we go. We'll try to utilize all the clinical data that I'm going to, you know, tell you today. It's going to be more high yield, you know, specific uh, to help you guys at the bedside to obtain more history related to the information that we'll be discussing on each of the, you know, individualized, you know, um, disease and it will help you to build, you know, an approach that you will apply for anyone with eosinophilic lung disease. So take a look at this because I'll be using these acronyms as we go. Uh, and Eosinophils or eosinophilic lung disease is one of the diseases that we get excited when we see them on consoles, but you know, oftentimes we might end up not having exactly what or having idea of what caused them. It's sometimes it can get challenging to know exactly what's driving all of that. Uh, so eosinophils, as you all know, so it has a major you know rule in uh, immunity against parasitic and helminthic infections, and as you all know, eosinophilic inflammation can be allergic and non-allergic as well. And it also it plays another role in adaptive immune response to other, you know, uh, viruses, tumors and bacteria as well. So if it happened that you looked at the microscope, this is how it looks like. It's a bilobed nucleus. And in the center where you see like the arrow is pointing is a lot of, you know, pinkish nodules where the uh, inflammatory uh, proteins actually reside inside the uh, neutrophils. So ma major basic protein, charcot lighten crystals, proteins and some other, you know, cationic proteins. So the release of those actually proteins is what causes the cell damage. So the reason that I'm showing you this diagram here is just to tell you that with the new agents, because now we live in a different era with the new biologic that even we started to use them to treat some of these eosinophilic lung diseases, not just only, you know, uh, T2 high or T2 asthma. So we started also to use them to treat uh, certain, uh, you know, eosinophilic lung diseases. A few things that you need to remember out of this slide is IL-5 is the main, you know, uh, uh, cytokines that promotes differentiation and uh, maturation of neutrophils. And this is, it is by far is the main driver of the eosinophilic inflammation and IL-4, IL-13, so they also contribute. IL-4, 13, they cause more, you know, work on the beta lymphocyte, as you see here, and also, you know, switching or w making the B cells to, you know, kind of, you know, uh, promote the class switching to IgE and making more IgE, more, you know, inflammation to the, uh, that would be provoked uh, by the mast cell, the granulation, the basophils, and also, the other aspects in asthma, it's mainly where, you know, IL-13 will cause more uh, smooth muscle, you know, growth, hypertrophy and mucus secretions. So um, the table that you have on the right is what we have available in our, you know, uh, armamentary MTUs for eosinophilic lung diseases. So we have <laughs> mebulizumab, benradizumab, you know, reslizumab and uh, Dobexin, which is anti-IL-4-13, and also the, I think, new kid on the block, the Tizi, is it map, which is a new re, a newly approved. Uh, Xenophilic lung disease usually the heterogeneous group of, uh, you know, uh, diffused lung diseases, as we will uh, actually go over, and they affect, uh, you know, uh, the lungs, mainly and sometimes also the other organs. Um, peripheral xenophilia usually present, but it's not all the time, so we have to keep that in mind. And um, they may cause also some impairment in the lung function and the uh, chest imaging as well. But the big you know, message here is that they are heterogeneous group of uh, lung problems. 
So I want you to remember this slide always whenever you see someone with eosinophilic lung diseases. Because remembering or having a theme, because when you take a history, you know, get physical and, you know, order some labs, you have to have some something at the back of your mind to just guide you of what diseases you would expect in someone who's presenting with some, you know, you know, respiratory illness plus some peripheral eosinophilia. So the easiest way that I find to think about it is just to divide it into limited and systemic form. So the uh, limited form, when I mean limited, limited to the lungs, OK? So it's either like an airway central problem or a parenchymal problem. If it's airway, it's going to be asthma, T2 asthma, eosinophilic bronchitis, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, or APPA. If it's parenchymal, we think about eosinophilic pneumonias, whether it's acute or chronic, and the Loeffler syndrome, which is, you know, part of some, uh, you know, parasitic infection. And if it's systemic, that means the lung plus other organs. So we think about EGBA, uh, or uh, formerly known as Scherg Strauss, or eosinophilic uh, with granulomatosis polyangitis, um, and infections like fungi parasitic infections, drug induced, inhaled toxins, malignancy and others. So each one of these words, you know, we'll be discussing, you know, in our, you know, part one and part two. And part two, I can tell you that we will just have some time to kind of, you know, use all this data and help you how you get good history, what to look for the exam and what lab to order for everybody and what you order for a specific group of body because we're not going to order everything on everybody because we have to have a differential and um, we will have a challenging case at the end uh, that probably will help us to apply all the concepts that we'll be discussing today. So it's in effect lung diseases, mainly the one that I highlighted on the left are the ones that I will spend more time on. The others that I have on the right, they are important and we have to keep them in mind, but they're not very hard to make when it comes to the diagnosis. All what we need is to keep a level of suspicion and we think about them when we take history because if we didn't think about the drug to be you know the main cause of the you know pulmonary illness and the xenophilia then we're gonna miss it so it's not there's no rocket science but the you know um the uh, other groups like egba hyperxenophilic syndromes abba and xenophilic pneumonias are the ones that will cover more in details and i'm not gonna discuss asthma here because it's a whole separate topic but we will actually give you, um, you know, uh, a quick synopsis on everyone that I showed you in the previous diagram. So definitions, eosinophilia, absolute eosinophilia count more than 500. Hyper eosinophilia, so I'm not saying hyper eosinophilic syndrome, hyper eosinophilia more than 1500, uh, with or without organ dysfunction on two exams separated in time by one month, okay? So you take like, it's not like a one spot, you, you check like another CBC or maybe if you chart check the patient, you see like maybe they have former eosinophilia that, you know, was overlocked or something in time. And alveolar eosinophilia definition is usually more than 10% in the PL cell count. And tissue uh, or lung tissue eosinophilia is just the presence of, you know, extensive eosinophilic infiltrate on surgical lung biopsy or transbronchial biopsy. So this is, sorry, it's a little bit small. I don't know why it projects that way. Um, so normally like the xenophil count of the BL it should be like around 1%. And as I said, 10 or more, it becomes more clinically significant. And so if it's more than, especially the BL, more than 25, those are the list of diseases that you will be concerned about. Uh, idiopathic chronic xenophilic pneumonia, idiopathic acute xenophilic pneumonia, or even sometimes even secondary uh, acute eosinophilic pneumonia can cause it, uh, EGBA, hyperosinophilic syndromes, and some other tropical, you know, uh, pulmonary eosinophilia and infections, and some mild to moderate is less than, you know, 25% on the BL, and that can happen with drug-induced and also uh, with fungal pneumonias. This slide, because we are pulmonologists, I need you also to keep it in your mind. It, it seems to be kind of, you know, not fitting the, I didn't tell you anything about these problems when I showed you the classification, but uh, I just put this slide here not to make the life of everyone harder, but just to keep it in mind, because the diseases that I showed you guys when it comes to epidemiology, eosinophilic lung diseases are rare, okay? 
but the stuff that I have and I showed you here, we see them, OK? Sometimes it, you haven't finished one year of your fellowship and you saw multiple cases of sarcoidosis, but how many cases of a GBA that you saw? So sometimes we have to, if we keep it at the back of our mind that, it, you know, some degree of pulmonary xenophilia can happen with sarcoid, with connective tissue disease, ILD, with IBF, with HP, organizing pneumonia and SIB, radiation pneumonitis, which we see quite often, and pulmonary lung enhanced cell histocytosis. But it's not the first thing. You shouldn't guide your history and physical to target these diseases, but just keep it in your mind if you see something that fits one of these uh, other lung problems. Medications. Medications, medication, medications, very important. Always when you take history, the most important thing is just to check. And this is the most important thing, not to, to you know, kind of do your drug screen and kind of figure out you know what medicines they talk that cause the xenophilia, but also to establish temporal relationship, which is the time between the drug you know intake and the onset of the pulmonary xenophilia. And the other thing that will help you to make a diagnosis of drug-induced you know pulmonary xenophilia is to see if the symptoms get better with the discontinuation of medicine, and the exclusion of other medical problems that can cause pulmonary xenophilia like infection, because it's usually diagnosis of exclusion. But if you see a medicine, you need to know when the xenophilia started to happen and when the patient did officially start taking the medicine and link that to the uh, pulmonary uh, xenophilia uh, syndrome. Always look at pneumotox when you see uh, these consoles and you know evaluate each and every medicine that they are on, whether inpatient or outpatient. So they can present as a wide array of problems like <laughs> secondary acute xenophilic pneumonia. They can present like ARDS. They can have someone just only with some abnormal chest imaging and xenophilia, and they may be asymptomatic. And it may be quite dramatic, and they can present as DRESH, which is a drug reaction with xenophilia and systemic symptoms, which can be life-threatening at times. So there is a wide you know, variety of you know, the way uh, that they can present. Those are the medications that you need to be cognizant of. Antibiotic, DAPTO, minocycline, nitrofurantoin, and the anti-inflammatory like mesalamine and sulfasalazine. Those are by far are the most, you know, medications that are, uh, you know, kind of incriminated in causing pulmonary xenophilia. And the list that you have on the, you know, right side, also there are potential medications that can cause pulmonary xenophilia. This is not meant to be you know, all inclusive, but it's something for you to keep in your mind. But the stuff that I highlighted and involved, those are things that you need to memorize. And the rest, you will figure it out when you do your, you know, uh, pneumotox uh, evaluation using either, you can have it in your, you know, phones or, you know, go to pneumotox.com. So I can't skip this without talking about everyone's favorite, daptomycin-induced acute xenophilic pneumonia. So when they locked into, you know, a systemic review of nearly 200 patients. And as you see, daptomycin was, you know, associated with, you know, is infinite pneumonia in about 32 cases, which is quite, you know, high. And uh, same thing for minocycline 32, nitrofurantoin, sulfasalazine. Um, so it is something that you need to be cognizant of. And what's important here is the temporal relationship. So in another study where they, you know, looked into acute xenophilic pneumonia caused by daptomycin, so the time duration between the onset of symptoms and the, you know, uh, date at which the patient started taking the medicine, it's, re it's ranging between 9 and 30 days. Because if you're going to build a case for daptomycin-induced lung injury, so they start taking daptomycin, you know, three days ago and now they present with respiratory illness and they are elderly already. They have, you know, osteomyelitis and heart failure. So that doesn't fit the picture. So this is why establishing temporal relationship between the medicine intake and the onset of symptoms. Uh, and it was bad in one third of the patients where they went into mechanical ventilation. Uh, and um, yeah, and it can be, you know, quite quite severe and the treatment will be to stop taking the medicine as you know and to give some course of steroids and usually two to four weeks will be enough to take care of it. Inhaled toxins, it's very important. So um, 
especially like in dust and smoke exposures, if you have someone who is a firefighter or someone who is trapped like in a house fire. So this is also another risk factors for acute xenophilic pneumonia. Um, people who work in the rubber manufacturers, people who actually, you know, like uh, trail polishers also, mm -hmm. that can happen. Crack cocaine, marijuana, heroin, inhalation, people who smoke like, you know, crack cocaine, that is another risk factors as well to cause xenophilic lung disease. And vaping, which is one of the, you know, new things that we started to see in the last, I think, since 2018, 2019. So there's a lot, you know, some case reported of acute xenophilic pneumonia after vaping. Uh, and of course, your smoking history is important as well. And we'll discuss that when we go over the acute xenophilic pneumonias. Um, so helminthic infections, they can actually cause a lung disease by a variety of ways. And the most, you know, uh, you know, famous thing is the Loeffler syndrome, which is the transpulmonary uh, passage of larva from the lung, bloodstream first to the lung and then back to the, you know, GI tract where they will, you know, finish the rest of the of the uh, worm or and the parasitic cycle. And that can happen with strangeloides, hookworms and you know, Ascaris and the rest will be either like direct invasion of the lung from the bloodstream or maybe hypersensitivity to the, you know, uh, parasite itself causing a lot of, you know, inflammatory response like, you know, tropical uh, isinophilia in Washeria bankrupti. So first, these problems, they are not coming in the United States uh, or Northern, you know, Amer America and Europe, but it's something for you to keep in mind. And the reason is, yes, it's not common here, but we have people who actually come here from all over the world and you have people who actually travel for business, for tourism. So you need to ask about this in your history and to keep it in your mind. And if you have someone with a lot of systemic manifestations, skin, you know, some GI symptoms and they have pulmonary xenophilia, so parasitic infection, it becomes high in your differential as well. Frequently misdiagnosed in the United States when they looked into this, because we think it's something rare and it cannot happen, but it's not true because of the reasons that I just told you. Uh, for strangeloides, it doesn't matter, even if you live in a Beverly Hills, you need to screen them for this because it can happen, okay? So regardless of your travel and exposure history, this is the only exception and the rest will be depending on what your history is gonna show you. I'm not gonna go over this in details. I have it for you in the slides if you wanna review it because um, you know, as you see for these, you know, infections is worldwide. So that means it can happen even in the US. Whenever there is poor sanitation, low socioeconomic status, that definitely can happen. So we need to keep it in our mind. Uh, and I listed here some of the other, you know, uh, parasitic infections where it's endemic in certain parts of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, Mexico, Central and South America as well. So this um i'll if you need to know more about parasitic infection and i think i think it's good to have this article because once in a while you'll see someone with some parasitic infection and lung manifestation it's a very great article and you have everything that you need about parasitic infection if you come across any infection fungal infections the only thing that you need to worry to know about is the coccidioidomycosis that can cause you know uh, you know pulmonary xenophilia and it's you know as you know, the map sh shows you it's mainly in the south, you know, uh, west, uh, you know, United States, Mexico, and also some parts of, you know, uh, Latin America as well. It can happen with crypto and mucor, and it's rare with the other problems like HIV and uh, TB. So it's mainly when it comes to the infection, the main thing that you need to be cognizant of is coccidioidomycosis plus parasitic infection, depending on your history. Uh, other new blasm that you need to be aware that may cause, you know, is xenophilic pneumonia, like acute xenophilic leukemias, some lymphomas, uh, poorly differentiated, you know, lung cancers can cause pulmonary uh, xenophilic disease, and some pulmonary myths in the lungs, especially if it's from the breast and colon and uh, the uh, genital organs, they can cause some unexplained. No one, no one knows, but it it it's been reported, you know, frequently in some case uh, series. Now we'll be discussing um, ABBA. So ABBA is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, and now they call it allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis. And the reason is because it's not something 
just only that happens with you know aspergillus fumigatus because it's basically a colonization of aspergillus fumigatus in the airways and it's just you know type one and type three hypersensitivity reaction but it can happen with other you know uh different you know classes of fungi like cladosporum alternaria penicillin and fusarium and, and many more okay um so a lot of inflammation because of the immune response more mucus production mucus plugging alteration in the you know uh you know normal you know lung biomes more infections more bronchitis and more respiratory compromise and this is how it works um so it can happen up to like 13% of asthmatics and 15% 2 to 15% of cf and 3 to 13 in some you know studies with asthma and the reason that I have listed to that because uh, asthma prevalence, because if you take the math in the US, there's 25 million of uh, people with asthma. So that means EBBA is very common than what we all think. OK, so as compared with the other uh, isonophilic lung diseases, I think when it comes to epidemiology, this might be one of the of the diseases that you will see quite frequent more than the rest of the other you know, disorders that I told you and then I will be telling you later. OK. ABBA people, they present with a wide variety of, you know, uh, symptoms, but usually they can have low grade fever, they can have malaise and we see them in clinic because of difficult to control asthma and we'll start the work up starting from that point. And I'll stop here for a second. When I say difficult to control asthma and when we think about ABB and the other problems, I'm assuming that, OK, diagnosis is right, is correct. We're dealing with asthma. We're not, you know, mixing this with something else. And because I do, I do want to repeat this more. And they are on a pro appropriate inhaler treatment. And the inhalational technique were demonstrated to the patient, and the patient is compliant, and they take their medication the way it should be, and they get it deep to their lung. So if you do all of that, and you treat the comorbidities like upper airway, like cough syndrome, GERD, and OSA, and you still have problems, this is the entity where you need to worry about other eosinophilic lung diseases. All right, so people they can expectorate brown, you know, uh, mucus plugging, and they can have hemoptysis as well. Uh, so the um, sinus correlate for ABBA, they can have bad sinus disease, where there's like, if you take a CT for them, it looks like cancer, while in fact it's just soft tissue filling the sinuses, and that's not due to fungal infection, but sensitization of the nasal sinuses to the uh, to the fungus and they call it allergic aspergillus rhinosinusitis and of course you will have elevated ige and peripheral eosinophilia so what do we know about what to find on the chest imaging for apba okay how common is that okay it's 25 percent so this is the finger and glove appearance where it's a tubular structure that's emanating from the hilum into the lung periphery. Uh, what else? Which is like mucus plaguing in the major airway. Central bronchitis. How common is that? Everybody? At the end of the usually disease, not the, the beginning of the disease. After the it is about 76%. And uh, I'm referring to like a big, you know, uh, study where I think they studied about you know, uh, I believe 150 or 200 ABBA patients. Um, and uh, it's in that article in chest. Uh, so where uh, central bronchitis is present in 76% of the cases, it's mainly affecting the mid to central lung zones and mainly the upper lobes, but it happens at the level of the lower part of the, you know, uh, upper lobes and to some extent the right middle lobe as well. And it's the bronchitis as you see in the picture uh, is the dilatation of the airway where you know the bronchoarterial ratio is more than 1.4 and it's affecting the medial one half to medial two third. If you see like with the green line, uh, with the red line, so next to it you might see some other abnormalities like three and bud, but there isn't significant bronchitis. The bronchitis is mainly more central. So the other differential diagnosis that you need to keep in mind when you see central and especially like mid lung zone kind of you know bronchitis is, is the you know uh, mac infection as well uh, and you may see some non specific finding like you know the you know cts that i just showed you like in the center maybe some ground glass maybe some tree and bud all what it tells you is some degree of bronchitis so the ct can be really heterogeneous and uh, there's a wide variety of 
of presentation. So it's not all the time finger and glove or central bronchitis. So what you see here, um, you know, in the CT scan is some tree and bud and what appears to be a tubular structure, something like that or mass, right? The on the, uh, you know, uh, left upper lobe. And if you take the, um, and this is very important, the mediastinal window of the same, you know, uh, you know, CT scan, you will see that the, you know, structure that appeared like tubular, like it has a different density. Uh, so, and even the density of that, you know, uh, lesion is almost like as the density of the skeletal muscle, if you look at the pectoralis or maybe the latissimus dorsi on the lateral side. And in the centers, there is some hyper dense and, you know, intensity, and they call that high attenuation mucus. OK, so it's present in about 19 percent of cases and it's very, you know, specific uh, for APPA. Uh, and it's due to the, you know, uh, colonization with the, the fungal colonization causing some high concentration of calcium, magnesium and iron in the mucus. Um, again, this is another demonstration to show you uh, the high uh, attenuation mucus where if you see like the arrow is pointing to something that looks like a mass, but you know, in the medias and the lung window mediastinal, it's something that's hyper intense. It looks like a calcification. This is hyper dense, uh, you know, uh, and high attenuation mucus as well. And the same thing is for the lower one where it looks really scary like mass and when you it's just a dilated airway with some, you know, uh, trapped mucus that uh, that has high concentration of calcium and that appears to be hyper dense on, um, you know, the uh, mediastinal window. And the way to get this uh, is by, of course, doing the Hounsfield units and usually high attenuation mucus is more than 70 plus 70 uh, Hounsfield units. Uh, normal CT in about 23% uh, of patients. So having normal CT scan, that should not make you exclude the APB, and this is very important. This is just to demonstrate how you can get it, you know, and to measure it is just to check the area of interest, I think, uh, or region of interest, ROI. Um, so what they found, which is now is getting more popularity, this, you know, high attenuation mucus, not just only to help you to make a diagnosis, but also to predict the course of the disease and the outcome. So they found the extent of bronchitis, which is the how many segments of uh, lung that has, you know, more bronchial destruction and central bronchitis. So the degree of bronchitis and the presence of high attenuation mucus, uh, they actually uh, pretend poor outcome and they pretend more risk of relapse. But when it comes to achieving complete remission, the high attenuation mucus, it didn't, you know, pretend, you know, uh, you know, a poor outcome. What it did, in fact, is the, uh, you know, um, degree of bronchitis, which if you see in the CT scan, so that means your patient is going to be a challenging case to manage moving forward. Uh, so how to make a diagnosis? I think the first part is kind of blocked by, you know, the screen, but I have some question mark next to it. So you will see it sometimes it's confusing. And instead of 1000, you will find 149, 409 and 19. So it's a different cutoff, but it's a matter of debate right now. But the most accepted criteria is what you see. Easy to memorize, just keep it in your mind until maybe they change the criteria in the next few years, who knows? Uh, but the one that we have, you have a, you have to have a, you know, a, a predisposing condition like CF4 asthma, number one, number two, major criteria or obligatory criteria, these two, they need to be met. So either you have aspergillus skin test or positive um, or high or detectable levels of uh, serum IgEs, you know, specific uh, to aspergillus fumigatus, okay? So either IgE, which what we order here all the time, I've never done like aspergillus skin test, so it's either one of them. You need to have it to be positive. And the second thing is your IgE, total IgE is more than 1,000 1, international unit per ml. You might see it when you read up to date and other sources that is 419. It's confusing. It's a different cutoff, but I think they want to have some high sensitivity and specificity, and that goes with you know, uh, one one thousand. But what happens if you have someone who looks to have clinically there's high suspicion of ABBA, but the total IgE is less than one thousand between five hundred and one thousand? Those people they you need to follow carefully, and sometimes 
they have exception in this criteria. You they if your anti aspergillus specific IgE is high uh, and the patient meets all the other criteria, uh, even though that their total IgE, let's say 800, so they meet this criteria if they meet everything else. And the minor criteria, you need at least two criteria to be met, either CT finding suggestive, the one that I just showed you, or your peripheral is in full count, absolutely is in full count more than 500, uh, or the presence of either precipitant serum antibodies to aspergillus or aspergillus specific IgE, okay? And it has to be more than 27 gram per, uh, per uh, liter, or milligram, I think, per liter. It's just a typing error. If you want to do bronc to prove ABBA, I can tell you that the BL galactamin has no role in that. And think about ABBA as a continuum, so it's not just you know black and white. Either you have it or you don't have it. So what's being proposed in you know medical literature these days is just to think about it as a continuum. You have, for example, like asthma. Um, so it progresses with allergic asthma with fungal sensitization. Um, and uh, asthma or severe asthma with, uh, you know, fungal sensitization, EBPA and EBPA with, uh, with bronch without bronchiectasis and with bronchiectasis. So what's important, sometimes we see them in clinic and we have someone with difficult to control asthma. You just, you know, as I said, check their, you know, EBPA workup and it's negative and we say, well, they don't have EBPA. Maybe now they don't have it, they don't meet the criteria, but over time you need to follow them carefully because they might be in the other part of the continuum, like over time they will sure develop it. So they might be in the stages that actually uh, precede the clinical diagnosis of ABBA. And it's all about increase or mounting T2 immune response. That's what causes the, uh, you know, uh, ABBA. Treatment, steroid is number one. And this is listed, it's expert opinion actually, but this is what they use, 0.5 keg per, per uh, you know, a day for two weeks, and then alternate it over every other day for eight weeks. And after that, you taper it off uh, five milligram every two weeks. Usually three to five months is very effective for most patients, okay? We need something objective while we're treating these patients. We go by their symptoms, but also we need to have something objective because if you are on steroid, everyone will feel better with steroids. So total IgE is, uh, is very important to follow. So in the first, uh, you know, one to two months, you should see 35% drop. And I will keep referring by percent. I'm not going to use normal, you know, IgE level, like less than 150, whatever, right? Or less than 300, because there isn't anything or such a thing that's called normal in these people. So you might get it to be dropped to something where it's baseline for them. So you don't have to strive to keep steroids for years trying to achieve normal IgE. Whenever they get to a ratio that's quite significant, it dropped by 35 at least. And I think if they reach about 60%, for most of the experts, this is a very you know, reassuring you know, uh, you know, response where you can taper off steroid and get them off of the steroid as long as their symptoms are better. So you'll not be chasing a normal numbers. You might be chasing a normal you know, uh, level or each patient will have a different normal baseline, I should say. Is this point clear? Okay. Antifungal, should we use antifungal from the get-go? Uh, the uh, IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, they want you along with the steroid and they highly advocate for this, but in, you know, Pomeyer literature, it is still controversial and we only use it in, in the, uh, if the patient is very, very much as high risk to develop like, you know, complications, they already have poorly controlled diabetes because you need something else to help you with the treatment to decrease the dose of steroid or maybe to taper it off very early. If the patient is relapsing and not having good response after you treat them, you see them in a month, IgE is not dropping, then you need to add something else uh, on, top of, uh, of, uh, on top of the uh, uh, steroid, of course. And what I have listed here, presence of ham, which is high attenuated mucus or significant, you know, bronchiectasis. This is when the CT and the nice thing is it helps you to inform your not just only the diagnosis, but it helps you to what other agents that you need to, to have. If you have someone with significant bronchiectasis and high attenuation mucus from the beginning, go ahead and start them on both. Don't wait because they relapse more and more bronchitis is associated with failure to achieve remission with only uh, with only being on steroids. So this is the dose that you would use if you ever 
uh, ended up using it. And that in the trial, they used them for 16 weeks, but sometimes you can extend them depending on the clinical response. And you have to know that you need to follow the LFT and also using liquid form, which is more expensive, I think, if it, when it comes to the outpatient uh, prescriptions. Uh, and that can be an issue, but this is the one that has better uh, bioavailability and better absorption. While the capsule is tricky, so you need to take it with meals because you need to have more acid in your stomach in order to, you know, uh, you know, uh, digest it. Sometimes we even tell people to drink it with Coke. ABBA, um, tap into it. All right, so the jury is still out for the anti IL 5 omelizumab. So sometimes in refractory cases, you can try it, but we still don't know the, uh, you know, uh, Dubix, uh, uh, the, uh, Dubilubumab is tongue twisting. Anyway, it's still under trial, so it's a phase three. We don't have results, but they are studying that for APPA. Isonophilic pneumonias. We have two types, acute and chronic. And the acute also either idiopathic. I'll be spending all the time talking to you regarding the idiopathic. Secondary, drug, 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 or infections, okay? So the acute form or the idiopathic form so usually, and pay attention to all these details because they are very important. So uh, usually in young males, it's around the age of 30, in 20s and 30s, so young male, precipitating factors not present all the time, but if you see it, it is very characteristic. Either they started smoking in college students, they started smoking heavily, or they change you know, their smoking habits. Maybe they smoke cigars now, or maybe hookah, who knows? And the quantity, they weren't smoking that much, and now they're smoking so so much. Uh, and if they stop and they rechallenge themselves and vaping, so it's been associated also with some uh, forms of uh, idiopathic acute uh, isonophilic pneumonias. Uh, and also people who are trapped in house fires, firefighters, any kind of smoke and, and dust exposure, this is what they actually reported in uh, the aftermath of 9-11 when people, they got exposed to a lot of dust in that area. So a lot of cases of uh, idiopathic, uh, you know, acute uh, interstitial pneumonia. So usually these people, they present very early within first week of, you know, starting the, uh, the disease or having the clinical disease. Uh, so they can present with a wide, you know, array of, uh, you know, symptoms starting from dyspnea and winding up having ARDS on the vent. Uh, usually asthma is absent. Asthma is not a main feature here, okay? And you have to make sure that, you know, you're ruling out the other problems or the other secondary causes of, you know, acute isonophilic pneumonia because they are more common, like cocaine, heroin-induced medication, inf infection, and et cetera. So if you ever have someone in the ICU who is young, you will ask yourself why this patient had this. It must be a bad luck or why they are. Maybe this is pneumonia and you are not convinced. So you have to rule out acute xenophilic pneumonia because that can progress to the point of having ARDS. And if you are only looking at the CBC and saying, oh, it's not on the differential because he doesn't have peripheral xenophilia. If you see here, peripheral xenophilia and early acute xenophilic pneumonia, it's not common. So not having acute or, uh, you know, eosinophilia and the, uh, you know, early stages of this disease is very common. So it shouldn't, you know, persuade you from, you know, not thinking about it and doing a prong to confirm it. BL, usually it's more than 25. It's, you know, high eosinophil count on the BL. And they usually improve very quickly to, to uh, steroid treatment. So there's nothing specific. If you see this, you will see this is pulmonary edema. This is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, ARDS. So bilateral ground glass, you know, patchy infiltrate. Uh, pleural effusion is not common, but it can happen. And if you ever tap them, so they have high pH and uh, high isonophil count as well. So you don't have to do a biopsy, but if you if they ended up being biopsied for whatever reason, so you will see like some, you know, isonophilic infiltrate with that. The arrow is pointing to the bilobed nucleus uh, isonophil in the alveolar space. Uh, treatment. Uh, usually it's supportive if they need to be on the vent. You can use high dose steroids for a few days and usually there is a quick response. If you give them like, a, you know, the solimidrol that everyone gets here with COPD exacerbation, they're not, ex you know, responding in one week. This is against, you know, acute xenophilic pneumonia. So you should see a quick response within, you know, a few days. And usually that steroid can be tapered off very quickly and four weeks is more than enough to achieve both clinical and radiological recovery as well. And they have, usually you may not even see them in clinic because they don't have any problems and 
it doesn't you know leave them with any sequela. Uh, so the chronic so contrast what I'm telling uh, what I have told you to the you know the clinical features for uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia because they are you know on the you know um, uh, they are to some extent you know uh, on the opposite side. So first it's rare we see that all the time. So what's your differential? You know, uh, chronic is inferior pneumonia when you see like abnormal high resolution CT scan. But how common is that? So when they studied this in people with interstitial lung disease, it's about two. Uh, this is the highest actually, 2.5, and in some series it's even 0.9. So it's not even that common. Okay. If you remember the slide that I showed you earlier, where it has HB sarcoid, and you'll ask me what's the what, how sarcoid can cause pulmonary failure? I don't know. But it's common disease, so we have to keep it at the back of our mind when we see, because those are the problems that we see a lot. So unfortunately, it is, uh, you know, uh, it's it's rare, but it's we think about it more than what we should. But we have to keep it at the back of our mind as well. It can happen. We don't know what's causing it. It's uh, still a, a matter of uh, of uh, of uh, clinical research. But they think that sometimes if you have a breast cancer, there is some radiation therapy that's received that might be actually uh, important, actually a uh, risk factor to develop acute uh, or uh, idiopathic chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. It's female more than male, two to one. And the other one I told you is, you know, more male. And it's in, you know, kind of middle age, 40s to 50s, with a mean age of presentations of about 45 years. Usually in non-smokers, while on acute eosinophilic pneumonia is mainly in smokers, and um, the clinical presentation, usually these patients, they will be sick for some time, so they don't come very quickly. They acute, they present very early within a week. This might take them like weeks to months to present. Symptoms can be dyspnea and about 90% of patients cough, hemoptysis, if they have necrotizing nodules, which has been reported as well. Asthma is very common and acute, uh, is in big pneumonia, they don't have asthma, but here asthma in almost three thirds of patients, they had asthma and often it precedes the, the illness and they have some other kind of etubi. So if you have someone with pulmonary xenophilia with abnormal CT scan and they have asthma and they have the other combo that comes with asthma, eczema, whatever food allergy, spring allergies or chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, so you need to think about the acute or the chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, knowing that it's a rare entity, but it can happen in the appropriate clinical uh, radiological context. So they may have, as I said, sick for some time. They may lose weight. They may have some other constitutional symptoms. The extra pulmonary manifestation, like having maybe some neuro symptoms like neuropathy, some arthritis, whenever you see some skin symptoms, if you think about chronic eosinophilic pneumonia based on the imaging, which I will discuss with you in the next slide, and the history, so they seem to have some extra pulmonary manifestation in your review of systems, that should make you think about EGBA and hyper eosinophilic syndrome because having extra pulmonary manifestation in chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is very, very rare and some even you know people who have like uh, you know a lot of experience with this and they actually have uh, especially like in France where they have I think the largest uh, cohort of the chronic eosinophilic pneumonia they think that they are people who are mislabeled as uh, you know chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and you should think about the hyper eosinophilic syndrome and the EGBA because those are the the eosinophilic lung diseases that are associated more with extra pulmonary manifestation because treatment will be different, prognosis is different, especially with hyperosinophilic syndrome because that might be associated with some malignancy. And if you don't think about it, this is a bad thing. So whenever you see extra manifest pulmonary manifestation, you need to rethink about the whole diagnosis if you're already labeled your patient with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. So uh, peripheral eosinophilia is common as opposed to the other one because there is more time for it to happen because this, these patients, they present over weeks to months as opposed to, you know, early to weeks. Uh, the BL, if you do it, is very high. So their, you know, eosinophil count, it can be, it's reported even, you know, 80% and 90%, but usually it's above 40% in the BL. Um, and of course, you have to rule out, and I keep repeating this, parasitic fungal and medication on every single patient that 
actually has a pulmonary eosinophilia because simply the cause could be one of these. So what do we know about imaging for? Uh, I think I should keep this secret. OK. Uh, <laughs> chronic is in fact pneumonia. The, the name uh, for it, like, like usually call it something like pressure angina, something. Uh, no, not my. Um, in acute, there's a bad. You're, you're close. You're, you're very close. Negative yeah, yeah, pulmonary. Negative. Uh, reverse uh, bad. Uh, bad sign in acute. Reverse bad sign. OK, so that means pulmonary edema, but on the periphery, right? Mm -hmm. Center is clear. OK, what's what's the name? Negative. No, not negative. It's yeah. photographic negative for me. Yeah. How common? How common? Less than 50%. OK, less than 50%. So if we see it, diagnosis for sure, right? Yeah. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. I think we may have taught you this, and I think I was told both sides about this. OK. So if you think, first of all, it's uh, present in, you know, 25% of patients, OK? But if you find it, unfortunately, if you believe that it's very characteristic for, you know, uh, a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, I don't think that's right because you can see it in the other problems. It can happen, especially with, uh, you know, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It can happen with sarcoid and some with some drug related, you know, pneumonitis. So it's not very specific, but if you have it in the appropriate clinical context with someone with asthma, female, middle aged, this is the way they presented with, you know, unexplained pulmonary eosinophilia, then this is what you're dealing with. But if you are just looking at the CT and, you know, you get considered, oh, more in the periphery and when you do X-ray and you find this, so it's not very specific or pathognomonic in any way. But it's very helpful sign if you if you find it. And in the, you know, uh, French, you know, cohort, you know, registry for the chronic eosinophilic pneumonia of about, you know, 70 or 60 something cases, it was, you know, present in 25% of cases. So this is how it looks on the CT scan because peripheral pays, you know, opacities. OK, um, and this is on the, you know, uh, other view here and the, uh, you know, uh, coronal section where you see like peripheral pays opacities. So in that study, the one that I just referred to, 62 cases. So you have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, not everyone had a biopsy. I think only um, 12 cases out of the, you know, 50, 62 had a biopsy, but the rest they were considered to be, you know, with a high degree of certainty based on the clinical data that they had chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. OK, so photographic negative pulmonary edema was present in 25 percent of patients and upper lobe predominant. And this is important. So it's a peripheral based obesities mainly favoring the upper lobe. And it can happen in the lower lobe, but it's not, it's uncommon. It's about 15% where the opacities that were mainly in the lower lobe. And in about half of the cases, it was upper and lower. Okay. And to make it more confusing, especially this entity, you will see like there is a migratory opacities. And I think when you see this, what comes to your mind as far as differential? Yeah, like ABBA. 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 Okay. What else? Okay. And this. Yeah. Crypt and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia and Loeffler syndrome. If you have someone with, you know, migrating larva or something, we don't see it, but this is the classic, you know, diseases. And if I if I told you that photographic negative is, you know, present in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and here I'm telling you also there's a migratory obesity that can happen in, you know, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So it's an important differential diagnosis to keep in mind. It's very hard to tease them apart, actually. The uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and chronic is infect pneumonia, but having something in the clinical context like unexplained per uh, peripheral xenophilia, it doesn't happen very often with cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So sometimes the CT only, it cannot give you the clue. And what makes it confusing if you are, you know, counting on your seat on your biopsy to tell you this is chronic xenophilic pneumonia and not poop, you will be wrong because sometimes you can have organizing pneumonia even when you biopsy them. This is why we do multidisciplinary discussion. Biopsy alone cannot make a diagnosis. CT alone sometimes cannot make a diagnosis. But good history, clinical context, CT, and biopsy is what makes the diagnosis. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying everything. You, you look at everything. So it's not just only, OK, if I do a biopsy, I can tell which is which, which is the zoonophilic pneumonia, chronic zoonophilic pneumonia, and which is the, the, uh, the uh, pool. Because when you give them steroid, 
So, especially as NFLs, they vanish very quickly, and you might still see the fibrinous exudate that's still in the alveolar spaces. It's very hard sometimes to tease out, especially if they are already been on treatment. So biopsy, it may also the especially the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia and and uh, you know uh, chronic azeotropic pneumonia. It can get tricky in order to you know tease them apart. But what what and the, at the end of the day, both of them, they are steroid responsive and they have favorable outcome as opposed to the rest of the other ILDs. And the fusion usually comes with the acute not uh, It can happen. Uh, I think it's rare. It's less than 10 percent. And I think there is a case uh, in the in your seek guys about daptomycin induced like injury, and they were like making a great deal about the presence of pleural fusion in that case. I think you will find it in one of the questions. Uh, I didn't go over it when I was preparing for this because I no longer have the access for the questions. But if you see it, it's not common, but it can happen. But if you see it with that picture, you will see, like, wow, pleural fusion, this is a heart failure, right? No, it can happen with acute xenophilic pneumonia, yeah. especially with daptomycin. That's what I'm saying. It com comes with acute, not chronic. Uh, acute, no, no. Chronic, there's no pleural fusion. Chronic, the pleural fusion, so this is what you see, obesities mainly. You might see some necrotizing nodules where hemoptysis has been reported, but it's not the main. The one, the message I want you to get: fleeting obesities, peripheral paste, obesities. Those are the main things. Perfusion is common in acute xenophilic pneumonia. It's not common. It's not it's common disease. Person. No, no. It, 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 I don't think it's common. The uh, the uh, the uh, perfusion. It can happen. Okay. But when you have it, so with that picture, sometimes it's very really hard to to tell. Is it pulmonary heart failure? But it can happen. Just keep it in your mind. There's nothing about the acute when it comes to the city is gonna help you the history and the clinical context, because imaging is ARDS like yeah. that's it. And so they quick, uh, they, they have a rapid re response to uh, steroids. This is the dose that we use 0.5 keg per day for two weeks, and we drop it down to 0 0.25, you know, over two weeks and slowly, you know, taper it off over six months. The problem is there's a very high, you know, response rate, but they relapse very very often. So more than 50 to 70 percent, they have a relapse when you start to wean them off the steroids and they might even need one year of treatment in some cords. Um, and the response is very quick within a week. It's, you know, similar to the acute, you know, uh, isenophilic pneumonia. You should see some significant improvement uh, with, with the symptoms and imaging when you start them on steroids. So this is just to sum up. I think this is just the summary of what we just discussed. The onset is very important, presence or absence of asthma to, you know, tilt them apart. So when you make your differentials, you should, you know, memorize this table and the presence or absence of smoking, the presence or absence of respiratory failure, because respiratory failure is more common with, especially like having hypoxia and being on the vent or maybe, you know, being very sick, requiring high oxygen requirement that goes more with acute form rather than the chronic form and uh, BL, it doesn't tell you, but the, the initially when you see them at first, not having, and this is a very important, not having peripheral xenophilia that doesn't take the acute xenophilic pneumonia off of your differential, you still can consider it. Um, and the chest imaging, as I told you, it's more, the other one is the RDS, the other one is the peripheral based obesities, and the relapse rate is more with the uh, chronic form. We'll stop here today. And any role of Thursday. Uh, suppressive medication in for? those patients chronic xenophilic pneumonia if they have relapsed. The IL-5 inhibitors? The chronic. Uh, yeah. What do you mean immunosuppressive? I mean, I mean, if if he got the steroid six months and then relapse again, you continue just steroid, just as, a, uh, uh, as, like, as I think a when I was preparing about this, no. I did not yeah, see, not really but all what you need sometimes is exactly. relapse. You need more time.